cozy reading tag, which was made by Taylor over at The Babbling Bee. And this tag, just with the reading mood I have been in this year, just the aesthetic I have longed for this year, uh, I was filled with glee I was as I was choosing the books for this. There are 10 questions, so I will dive right in. And the first one says, The Kettle's On, a book of steadfast comfort, always there for you, makes any day better, like a cup of tea. And I could not limit myself to just one book for these, so I have several books for each answer. And first is Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. I am lucky enough that um, despite the fact that I read this for the first time as an adult, I still fell absolutely in love with it. And it's all down to the fact of how endearing Anne Shirley is as a character and just the way that she savors and relishes life and that it um, just really being present enough to see those little joys and delights and beauties in the world around you is so inspiring. And she does mess up a lot in this. She makes a lot of mistakes, but she grows and changes and learns from them. And I love that about her. And then a really easy breezy modern classic you could read in the matter of a couple hours. You could sit, uh, you know, over the course of an afternoon and read Mrs. Eris Goes to Paris by Paul Gallico. I love the character of Mrs. Eris and how I guess plucky is the word I would use for her. She's just so full of um, vim and vigor. And I love seeing characters uh, as protagonists in books that are not uh, super young. You know, there are many ages and phases of life and I think not enough uh, books focus on people who are middle-aged or older and I love that about this and getting to see her go on an adventure where she, you know, she's never left her little part of London. And so for her to go on this trek to Paris to get a beautiful Dior gown is marvelous. And it also has some very endearing illustrations and I will try to find one of them for you. Here she is when she gets to the house of Dior and she wants to buy her dress and she just dumps all her cash out on the table and embarrasses the secretary there. Uh, I love Mrs. Eris Goes to Paris. And then an Elizabeth Googe, the Elliot family trilogy. Uh, and this is a glorious, glorious combination of interesting characters with depth and flaws, uh, but you are still sympathetic to them and a very vivid um, setting that is a character in and of its own. Um, Damerche, is that the name of it? Uh, oh gracious, yes, Damerche. Um, and it is this house by the seaside and these covers are mega cheesy, but this is a wonderful, wonderful series. And I think, hmm, I think maybe uh, Pilgrim's Inn might be my favorite one. There's a Christmas scene in each of these two, which adds to the charm of them. And this first book, for those of you who have been longtime subscribers, will, will remember that I had this in a bag when I was on a trip with my husband and we were walking to our Airbnb and it was raining and I didn't realize the rain was soaking into the bag and that's why this book is wrinkled. So it's sad, but I still love this book and I love this trilogy. The next question, question two, is Grandmother's Quilt, a book that reminds you of a loved one or a comforting book that was given to you or read aloud to you by someone dear. Now the first book is not a comforting book, but it reminds me of someone dear. And that is just in general, the author Ruth Rendell. Uh, this is quite the cover. This is, I think it's from the 60s. Let's see. It is from 1975. So I was off by a decade. Um, and then a very unusual little book plate there. No one wrote their name in it, but just an odd book plate. But um, Ruth Rendell's Inspector Wexford Mysteries. I just, I'm so, uh, you know, forever grateful to my grandmother for introducing me to them. And I just really enjoy seeing um, Inspector Wexford, who is uh, more of a bleeding heart liberal, working with Mike Burden, who is definitely more conservative. And so the two of them make a really good pair together. 
And she also has some books written under a pseudonym, Barbara Vine, and then some standalone books, which I've only read a couple of. So I, I definitely want to continue on reading more Ruth Rendell. And um, yeah, hopefully just eventually I would read all of hers because I love her. Then um, two that I remember specifically my dad reading aloud. And the first is The Hobbit, which isn't The Hobbit. I mean, one of the most extremely comforting books about Bilbo the Hobbit going with uh, many, many dwarves and into uh, just unknown territory that he has never been before. He, Bilbo is definitely a homebody. And the quests that they go on, you just are really cheering them on as you're reading about it. And it's written in such a friendly kind of tone. And then uh, Gone Away Lake and Return to Gone Away Lake by Elizabeth Enright. And it has been delightful for me uh, growing up someone who loved Gone Away Lake and Return to Gone Away Lake uh, about Portia and uh, her brother Foster visiting their cousin Julian and discovering these old abandoned Victorian mansions in the woods. It used to be a sort of resort community and now it's just turned into a swamp. And so they refurbish a couple of the Victorian mansions and it's full of charm and a love of childhood. So it's been a delight for me since I already loved that to now be reading her Melendi Family Quartet and loving it as much, if not more. Um, so that has been just such a treat this year. And question three, Warm Spice, a book with particularly vivid prose or imagery, a story comforting in its richness, depth, or vibrance. So I think these would all fall under the um, dark academia kind of, kind of vibes for it. And the first are Phyllis Whitney's books. I just finished Thunder Heights. I read it as a buddy read with Brie from Falling for Romance on Bookstagram. And the way that she makes um, the atmosphere and the ambiance of a house um, when, you know, a woman who is not familiar with it comes to the house and um, is kind of taking everything in and trying to figure out where she is, uh, kind of finding her footing in this new setting. But there's lots of kind of just this haunting atmosphere about these places. It's always a woman on her own traveling to a new place. Um, and Camilla was the protagonist in this, Camilla King, and I adored her. This one is on the shorter side. It was only around 220 pages. Um, but Every Phyllis Whitney, you know, has the same kind of vibe and formula, and I love the formula, so I'm very okay with them being formulaic. If it's a good thing, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and that definitely falls under that category. Then Susanna Kearsley's books. I think people who like Phyllis Whitney could definitely enjoy Susanna Kearsley. Um, she has a lot that are focused on, like, Scotland and England, this one, interestingly, is set in Long Island, and I'm only in the middle of this one. It's very exciting to be picking up a Susanna Kearsley again. This is in my TBR 2020 TBR stack project that I'm still doing, but she just has a way of making you feel like you are right there with the characters, and particularly in Mariana, there is a real dark atmosphere to it, um, and it's just delicious. It's delicious. And then, I mean, throwing it back to one of the original ones, and that is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. The character of Jane, just getting to go on a journey with her as she goes from being a very unloved child um, in a really unkind household to um, a school that is not filled with a lot of love, but she does have some kindred spirits at the school. And then her journeying to Thornfield Hall, um, where it's very mysterious and she has some questions about some different things she is witnessing there. Uh, and it's not until the end that all is revealed, but it is just such a, um, uh, just how you are thrown into this story. You're on the moors, you are in, you know, the foggy, uh, woods and venturing around Thornfield Hall while it is dark. And I love it for it. And then a new love, 2020 love, is Juliette Morillier. So now I've read Daughter of the Forest and Son of the Son of the Shadows. And good gracious, just such rich, vivid imagery. 
um, this kind of Roman Britain setting and seeing how the characters, because of the, like, the druid elements in this, really view their connection to the land, it makes for a really um, just uh, so... It makes me ache to be in these places. Obviously, I would want like modern medical care, but it does. I have this ache to be in a place that I've never been. And then Grania by Emily Lawless, set on this small island. It's one of the islands of Erin, off the coast of Galway. So it's an, uh, off the coast of Ireland. And it is just um, a fiery burst of a book. Um, it is not long and you can feel it building towards the climax the entire book and then when it happens you're left in shock and you kind of have to pick up the pieces of your heart after you have finished it um, but just this island is such a key component it would not be nearly as magical of a book if it didn't have that setting in it and then lastly and these are very sad but so beautiful and potent to read the Kristen Lovren's daughter um, trilogy by Sigrid Unset. You're following Kristen throughout her life. So the first one is the wreath, then the second is the wife, and last is the cross. And it is full of really vivid, beautiful religious imagery, particularly Catholic imagery, and it makes it so memorable. And it just gripped me in and it would not let me go until I finished. I did have to take my time because there are some really intense things that happen in here. Um, but it is just a marvelous, marvelous trilogy. So I do want to read more by Sigrid Unset, but I haven't worked up the courage to do it at this point. The next question says, Candlelight, a book that keeps you going or encourages you when you feel dark. And I have a few books here. Um, the first, and I'm going to copy Taylor, and that is Martha's Vineyard, Isle of Dreams by Susan Branch. I am forever grateful to Taylor for bringing Susan Branch to my awareness. I did not know about her before. This is her um, story of the, of the years after her husband had left her and she was grieving and, you know, grieving her marriage, uh, the, the loss of her marriage and moves up to Martha's Vineyard and gets this teeny little cottage and it's her time of healing. And what I love is that it is just chock full. It looks handwritten and it's chock full of pictures. And um, let's find a good one here. She's got enchanting little drawings in here. It's filled with quotes and marvelousness. And it's a very rich, rich kind of tapestry of life softening things. And then... The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. So far the only Elizabeth von Arnhem that I have liked, unfortunately. But what I love about this is the second chances the characters in this have and people who have kind of just gotten so used to focusing on the flaws in their spouse, they forget there were some things that they really genuinely liked about them. And so they kind of get a, a reset where when they go, um, when they go to Italy, uh, after seeing a notice in the Times that says those who appreciate wisteria and sunshine, uh, and they go to stay in a small medieval Italian castle to be let for the month of April. Uh, now there is a modern, um, a modern retelling of this called Enchanted August by Brenda Bowen. I just saw that advertised there. You know how I am with like modern contemporary retellings. I don't know if I would like it, but does sound like an intriguing read, maybe for summer. And then lastly, I would have to say the Barsetshire series by Anthony, <clears throat> by Anthony Trollope. Um, Friendly Parsonage in particular has a couple of plot lines with the characters that I really loved um, seeing different things happen to them. You have a lot of characters in here and a lot of endearing characters and they can kind of be foils to the characters that can really just drive you kind of crazy. Uh, and I love that about it. And then question five says, Laugh Medicine, a book that makes you, oh, I almost forgot. For a book that encourages you when you feel dark, I also, they're so heavy. So <laughs> I grabbed all of the illustrated Harry Potters and I wanted to show you one illustration from each. Now the fifth one has not come out. Jim K is the illustrator and 
I did see one article in like March where he has really been struggling with depression. So I don't think it's coming out this autumn like they typically are. Here's Hagrid's hut. And that is one of the aspects I love about these stories is seeing, um, you know, Harry, Ron, and Hermione going over to spend time with Hagrid and having kind of inedible rock cakes. That's not nice, but <laughs> having tea and just, you know, doing life with a very good friend. And then this one, I mean, does not the castle look so appealing. And this is lovely, even if I don't feel like actually reading something, just flipping through and looking at these pictures. Here's another snowy one, and this is Hagrid's hut again. And then, oh yes, look at this. The Hogwarts Express in the rain. So those are lovely, just visually, even alone, you know, I adore the stories, but to have that kind of lovely, lovely visual is wonderful. Okay, the next question, question five says, Laugh Medicine, a book that makes you laugh out loud or grin widely, coming to the rescue on the gloomiest of days. And I have two books that I picked for that. One is a standalone. Wait, that's a lie. I've only read the first one. Um, and that is Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. It is so Funny, just these three men who have no experience with sailing, sailing down the Thames River. It is hysterical. So I have not read Three Men on the Bummel. I've heard it's not quite as good. So that's why I haven't done it yet. I'm a little nervous. Um, but then the All Creatures Great and Small series by James Harriet. And these, I adore this series. I adore this series. And it does have some very sad things in, that happen in here, but the funny things to me outweigh it so much more. And particularly the dynamic between Siegfried, um, who is the head veterinarian, and his kid brother, um, Tristan, who is in, in vet veterinary school finishing up at the very beginning of the series. And one particular anecdote that comes to mind is when um, uh, Siegfried is very precious about his car. He does not want anyone else driving it. He has made that clear. So he gives James and Tristan kind of the junkier car to drive around. Well, the junkie car breaks down and, and they do have to drive the nicer car. And he is very, you know, gives them explicit instructions about how to take care of this care, take care of this car so carefully. And he, um, is ill also at the time. So he has laryngitis and can't talk loudly. And Tristan, just through a series of circumstances, wrecks the car and he makes sure to tell Siegfried while he has laryngitis so he can't fully yell at him. And it's a very, very funny scene. All right, moving on to number six. In bed all day, you've got your warm drink and a cozy blanket. What do you read when you're curled up in bed all day? So I have been just wanting to read more mysteries this summer. I just finished Miss Pym Disposes by Josephine Tay, and it was stunning. So I do think that mysteries are so plot oriented that I love how the pages just, they want to be read and you feel called to read them. So I did kind of the first four mystery series that came to mind. The first is Donna Leone's Commissario Brunetti series, where um, he is in Venice and you're following him kind of the uh, fighting against the nepotism that is in the government in Venice, uh, but just the relationship he has with his family, um, the sort of uh, acrimonious relationship that he has with his father-in-law. And it's just, all together such a rich and colorful series with a lot of depth to it. And then I do also love to listen to mysteries on audiobook. Something about mysteries are very conducive to audiobooks. And the two series that I particularly love, I mean, I love a lot of mystery series on audiobook, but the two that I have written down here um, is Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot series. Um, they are, they just come alive when read aloud. I love David Suchet's narration, but I can't always access those. Hugh Fraser, who played um, Hastings in the TV adaptation with uh, with David Suchet, 
does a, a really excellent job. Uh, and then also the Agatha Raisin audiobooks by M.C. Beaton. I love following Agatha. You know, through her daily life, she has her two cats, Hodge and Boswell, that she takes care of. She lives in her little, um, uh, you know, thatch-roofed house and uh, in the Cotswolds and um, getting to see her go out to dinner with friends and also, of course, solving murders. Uh, and then lastly, the Inspector Lindley series by Elizabeth George. These, to me, take as much concentration as a classic. So the hangover that I have from them is the same that you would have with a classic. And then, let's see, Endless Comfort, a book that brings you solace no matter how many times you read it. So firstly, let's get a couple out of the way that you're going to have known immediately as soon as you heard the question. Uh, firstly, wives and daughters. And I kid you not, as soon as I finished this, this May, and I was talking about it in, you know, a couple book discussions that I did of it, I was sad that I had to wait a whole other year before reading it. But I definitely don't want to read it more than once a year because I do not want to wear the story out. It is incredibly consoling just to have just such familiar characters and to know the story in and out so thoroughly um, makes it a lovely experience. So I don't want to wear that out. And then, of course, the Betsy Tacy series by Maud Hart Lovelace. Um, Betsy is fairly immature, uh, particularly in the high school books. And so um, I think that can be kind of frustrating at times, but then she also is always trying to grow and change. So I love kind of meeting Betsy where she's at in the series. And then I do love that we have, I think, um, she really feels very grown up in Betsy's wedding. And I love that about it. But the ones that I have coming up uh, next to read in my reread this year that I'm doing with Rainy um, for Rainy, Rainy Day Reads is Betsy Was a Junior and Betsy and Joe. Um, and I will just show you one little illustration. I mean, look at that. So these books are just so familiar and near and dear to my heart. And then Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. You know that over the past few years with my Cinderella Chronicles project, I love the, um, the notion of a Cinderella story. And this is done so well in its original, um, where Ella is gifted by a fairy in the very beginning the gift of obedience. And I love the magical world that she lives in. I love going, you get to um, go to boarding school with her. And then you also get to travel around and meet different magical creatures. And um, it's the character of Ella is wonderful. And that's really um, kind of the heart of this book is Ella. And then um, where is it? Miracles on Maple Hill by Virginia Sorensen. I did a reread during middle grade March and it lived up to my expectations of it. It is a book where um, the characters are very much savoring their surroundings and just enjoying kind of the healing power of nature and what a respite it can be. And um, I highly recommend the audiobook of it. And then lastly, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I do say that Emma and Pride and Prejudice are tied for me, but I have reread Pride and Prejudice more. Um, I'm a little worried Emma won't live up to my memory of it. I think that's part of it. I love these. Um, I think they're called the Heirloom Collection. I'll try to find for you a nice illustration. Oh, here's Pemberley. Um, just the rhythm of the story. I love the rhythm, all the all of the visiting and people talking in houses, which is a complaint that people have about Austin. But I, I love that about this story and the great, great uh, amounts of humor in it. Um, make it such a delight to read. And then the next question says, Portable Hope, a book that restores your faith in humanity, faith in life, faith in yourself. A book that says it's going to be okay. The world is full of good things and tomorrow will be better. I have a few books here. And... Yes. Okay. So the first that will not come as a surprise if you've seen a few of my recent videos, and that is This Beautiful Truth by Sarah Clarkson. I felt like this just gave my soul a reset, revisiting this and thinking about all of the goodness that I get to witness in my everyday life. And I can just let it pass me by if I'm not paying close enough attention. And all of the blessings that you can miss out on if you aren't, I mean, it's kind of encouraging slow living, I would say, but just savoring every last beautiful moment that you get to witness and seeing God's goodness in that. 
and then the letters of Elizabeth Gaskell because this is a lady well it's a you know it's a real woman who lived through some tough things uh, she had a baby boy that died and she had um, just a slew of vague kind of incurable health problems she would have seasons where she felt better but she never really got explanations and she she kept on carrying on and she wrote some amazing books despite all of that and she writes with such humor and such grace and warmth it's lovely to see her writing to her friends she had so many people that she knew and i love that about it and then um just finished this time next year we'll be laughing by jacqueline winspear an amazing book about a girl who was raised um you know world war ii era and um just to see how her experiences and that of her grandparents during world war one comes into play in her detective series of Maisie dobbs is really fascinating and just to see the ways that people can be so resilient and another one a few eggs and no oranges the diaries of vera hodgson uh from 1940 to 1945 she lived in london during this time and just to see how someone keeps doing life um, when you are constantly worried the blitz will be happening is amazing. I am in awe of her as I read this and she's writing about her, the day-to-day -day happenings. It is fascinating and riveting and encouraging. And then lastly, a book I haven't read in years, but it has always stayed with me and that is The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Reading about people um, just living in a time when it can be really scary to do the right thing to stand up for people um, that no one else was standing up for is incredible and so encouraging and challenging and the next one says a basket for your neighbor just as it's lovely to be comforted by books it can be lovely to pass the comfort along imagine you were putting together a cozy comfort basket which books would you include alrighty let me get these books together Okay, firstly, Cider with Rosie by Lori Lee. This has, um, I mean, kind of just so much of what I love in books is in here. If you like the kind of modern classics that I like, you should read Cider with Rosie. Um, there's a lot of funny occurrences, but it is very, uh, I love the charm that it has because it is very pastoral. And you're getting to see um, just little village life and here he's playing an instrument for his family and um it's just very very charming uh it does the last chapter i always want to say this the last chapter is very weird and so it does not fit the rest of the book i'm always so perplexed by it being in there um but other than that i highly recommend cider with rosie by Lori lee um and then i'm you know very much in the mood for Rosamund Pilcher because of the July really long happening and uh, coming home. I mean, this is a book that I think maybe for people that are more, I don't know, they wouldn't want to pick up a big chunky classic. Uh, they'll, they'll be more comfortable picking up a more modern book. And this was written, I think sometime in the nineties, um, 1995. So I think that's, you know, obviously going to intimidate people less. And um, then, Miss Pettigrew lives for a day. I love the format of this where each chapter um, is a day. It's got really charming illustrations. So this chapter is from 520 p.m. to 621 p.m. And uh, it gives you, you feel you are there with the characters experiencing everything they are experiencing. Um, then A Room with a View by E.M. Forster um, following Lucy Honeychurch as she goes to vacation in Italy in various places. Florence is one of the main um, places and then it travels back to England. It is quirky and unusual and I love that about it. And then picture books are not just for adults. Um, so firstly, the Brambley Hedge books by Jill Barklam. And okay, I have to find for you specifically there is one yes look at this this tree where the mice reside and you can see they have little pantries and bedrooms and it's all organized and how delightful is that in this tree um and just getting to follow these mice on their adventures and they have there's a summer wedding one and then um oh my goodness look at this 
and where is it? Yes, there is a winter ball or a snowball. That's what they call it. Can you see? Oh, look at this. I mean, doesn't that just feed your soul? And of course, Beatrix Potter, the complete tales. I adore Beatrix Potter's writing and it's incredibly pleasant to read aloud. And here's a little map of Beatrix Potter's world. I love that. And um, I mean, there are really, most of her stories I do love. Um, the Flopsy Bunnies is particularly delightful. Um, Squirrel Nutkin, uh, he is very sassy. And um, yes, so, so many um, enjoyable stories. So I, that reminds me, I want to read through that with Arthur. I think he's the right age for it. Um, so that's the basket for your neighbor. And then the last question I am taking so long on this tag is a walk in the woods. Tell us about a book with beautiful nature writing or a book that restores your peace. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> Firstly, um, Far From the Matting Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy has such a reputation <clears throat> for his nature writing and with good reason. Definitely recommend Far From the Matting Crowd. Oh, my favorite book of last year, Waterfalls of Stars by Roseanne Alexander, um, where she and her husband go to live on Skomer Island, this very isolated island. And a few months of every year, they have puffins. And um, there, it is incredibly isolated and desolate. You know, it, they can only travel um, to the mainland a few times a year to get supplies to live but she is just so drawn in and taken in by this island. And uh, then Sylvia's Lovers by Elizabeth Gaskell. A Gaskell that is not talked about as much, but I very, very, very much want to reread this. I love, I underlined so many quotes in this. And um, flocks of seagulls hovered about the edge of the waves, slowly rising and turning their white under plumage to glitter in the sunlight as Philip approached. The whole scene was so peaceful, so soothing, that it dispelled the cares and fears, too well-founded, in fact, which have weighed down on his heart during the past hours of the night. Um, Philip walked on pretty briskly, unconsciously enjoying the sunny landscape before him, the crisp, curling waves rushing almost up to his feet on his right hand and then swishing back over the fine, small pebbles into the great swelling sea. To his left were the cliffs rising one behind another, having deep gullies here and there between with long green slopes upward from the land, and then sudden falls of brown and red soil or rock deepening to a yet greater richness of color at their base towards the blue ocean before him. The loud monotonous murmur of the advancing and receding waters lulled him into dreaminess. The sunny look of everything tinged his daydreams with hope. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's so beautiful it hurts. Um, Yes, this is uh, set in, it's based on Whitby in England. Uh, it's a fishing town. It feels very different from a lot of uh, pastoral Victorian novels you would read. And um, it just gripped me. I could not put it down. And then another one, the landscape is just so um, integral to the story, A Welsh Witch. Um, so obviously this is set in Wales. Um, and uh, kind of a love triangle love square happens in this and just seeing these characters in the vivid imagery it gives it an otherworldly quality that i love and then on uh lighter notes two of them first is the blue castle by ellen montgomery this book starts out pretty um sad and also pretty slow but i think if you keep at it if you go maybe six chapters then the rest is glorious um valancey Sterling, you're following her, seeing her living in a life that she does not love. And then she gets a letter that changes everything. And that's all that I'll say in case someone he who's watching has not read it. And then A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. I think people who like Anne of Green Gables would definitely like A Girl of the Limberlost. Let's see if there's a good picture for you in here. Um, you know what? There aren't that many pictures, but I do really like... Can I get to it? Mm, well, just, it has little floral things on each one. This is not my older copy. That one is, is more delicate. I didn't want to hold it up for this. Um, I love A Girl of the Limberlost. Getting to see Elnora, kind of, who's so, she is just hungry for knowledge and she loves 
the Limberlost and learning about all of the moths and butterflies that are there, the different wildlife, and then getting to go to school. It's a dream come true for her. And she's a lovely, lovely character to follow. Okay, I've gone on so long for this tag. Taylor, you made uh, an irresistible tag. Um, consider yourself tagged if you would like to do this. Uh, I, I would just want anyone who would like to do it to go ahead and do it. And I hope that you enjoy this and I'll be back with another video soon. Bye.